the title of my talk is to do with profits and all of you might be wondering that what is a sadhu who has given up the world and incidentally for your information there is a strict law amongst our spiritual tradition that sadhus can't even touch money can't have bank accounts we can't even accept gifts so what is a sadhu doing in a conference and the title of the talk is hovering around profits so let me explain that all of you are businessmen manufacturers successful businessmen and some may be supremely successful businessmen so all of you here know the journey or the story of or the value of profits but let me take you beyond that and explain to you the profit of values the value of profits would be a simple journey that if you have an idea an idea alone is imagination until it is turned into an invention but an invention itself is a fascination you can have so many inventions around you but if it has no purpose an invention is just a fascination until you turn it into a product a product has to have a purpose utility value i could have something beautiful in my house but if it's not meaningful or it is not utilized it's not a product a product alone can be a patent you can patent a product but if you can't push it into the production line then a product alone is meaningless so for a product to be meaningful to multiple people and to for it to become a, into a production line till then it is meaningless but if you take an idea create an invention turn it into a product and then you turn it into a production line until those products begin to sell they are worthless but selling something is not enough we know so many companies that create so many products and yes they sell so many things but if they don't turn into profits your figures have to show profits they have to turn into profits till then everything is worthless so all of you here because you are successful you know of the entire journey of taking an idea and turning it into profits despite the fact that your industry is hazardous despite the fact that your industry is sensitive and critical you have the ability and know how of turning an idea into a profit but let me take you beyond the hill there is a world beyond profits because profits themselves are uncertain they are fickle and feeble you know the reason why profits are uncertain because they are dependent on so many factors it could be production it could be raw material it could be the exchange rate it could be the commitment of your workers it could be strikes it could be anything so profits are uncertain they are feeble they are fickle to make your profit stable sustainable to add stability and sustainability and a sense of dignity to our profits you need values because values add life to what you and i are so how do you turn profits into something which are sustainable and that they add value to your own life every man or woman on this earth wants to be successful who doesn't want to make money who doesn't want to create a name but this evening or this morning i want to explain to you 
we want a name that is respected. And if you want fame that is accepted, I can give you a list of rich people who may not be really respected. And there are so many famous people on this earth who perhaps are not even accepted. They may be put into the bracket of weird, outlandish, not natural. So if we add values to what we have, profits, and if we can generate profits through a system of values, we will be able to create a name that is respected and fame that is accepted. But to understand this in a more genuine way or in its own raw status, let me take you into the jungles of creation. When the early man was roaming the forests. This is an anecdote, perhaps it's imaginary, but the purpose or the message of the story is absolute real. This early man, he was roaming in the forest and of course he was threatened by every animal and more so by the king of the jungle, that's the lion. The man is roaming the forest, the lion starts chasing the man. For his own life, man starts running, running, running here and there, helter-skelter, the lion is chasing the man. To save himself, he finds a tree and starts climbing the tree. Obviously, the tree is the terrain of the monkeys. Straight away, a huge monkey stops man climbing the tree and says, hey, 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 you left the trees long ago, you don't belong here, so go back to your ground. That's when man his ability to strike a deal. I think all these words would be very familiar with you. His ability to negotiate. His ability to save his skin at any cost came into play. So there in the middle of the tree trunk, man starts arguing with this monkey and says, hey, let's negotiate. The monkey says, no, the time of negotiations are over. You belong to the ground. I belong to the tree. You left the tree of your own will. So go back to the ground. Man says, hey, look, be, be, beneath me, there's a lion. He's a common enemy. <laughs> he eats me and eats you. So when we have a common enemy, let's become friends. That's how friendships and cooperations are mostly forged. The monkey starts listening to man, and as they climbs up into the tree, and there the lion he very well knows that sometime, let in few days or a few more weeks, one of them has to come down and they are my ready meat and meal. So lion starts circling the tree. Man and the monkey are talking. The monkey says, oh no, all your life you have ridiculed me, made fun of me, you've joked about me. Man says, that was the past, forget it, not now. If you save me, if you keep me on the tree, from now onwards, I'll never make fun of you. And I will teach my generation to adore monkeys. So please let me be on the tree. While they're on the tree, again, the typical mind of man. He tells the monkey, yes, what's the point of both of us keeping awake? Both of us are sleepy, let's take turns. Eight hours I sleep, eight hours you sleep. When the other guy sleeps, you need to take turns to, for security and watch and guard. Before the monkey could say anything, man said, look, I have been running, I'm tired. So I go first. That's again what you do in business. Me first. So the man goes to sleep on the branches. The monkey is watching guard, keeping guard. After a couple of minutes, the lion he whispers to the monkey, say, hey, all you need to do is to give this man a little shove. And if he's down, he's my meal. Nobody will know. Nobody is watching. Just give him a little shove. And man is dead. And we'll celebrate. The monkey said, no, 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 no. I've given him my word. It's the first time man has come to me. I've given him my word. I will not break my word. The lion says, but think about it. 
he has been ridiculing you your whole ancestors the entire generation of monkeys so what's wrong in taking revenge and settling the score now give him a little nudge he's dead finished i'll go and i guarantee you that you can freely roam the forest without any creature touching you fearlessly reward and punishment the monkey says no 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 my ancestors have given me a value that i will not break my word and my promise given to anybody so i won't do it after 8 hours man wakes up is the monkey's time to go to sleep the lion has already decided that they have grouped up so there's no point of me talking with man or negotiating with man but before the lion could understand the monkey is sleeping man whispers to the lion and say hey can we strike a deal typical man the lion says what he says you want a meal and i want a life i'll just push the monkey you eat him have your stomachs fill and i'll go free and from now onwards we will not breathe the word about it you are still the king of the jungle but i am a free man the lion understands this is okay man is negotiating and striking a deal just when man was about to push the monkey the monkey gets up springs up to life and gets hold of man he says i knew it i knew it you are typical man double crossing cheating deceitful conceiting so now i'm not going to let you go you go down to the lion you dead he's hanging the man and holding him through by his throat is about to throw him down man says hey hey wait a minute i was just joking <laughs> don't believe the lion i never had anything planned i was just trying to test the lion whether he falls for it or not please please forget it it was just a joke it's some slip of mind some mistake i'm emotionally wounded i'm tired please forgive me the lunk monkey says i forgive you on one account i forgive you on one account from now onwards never tell anyone that man descended from the monkeys man never evolved from the monkeys man has just devolved we monkeys don't break the values that we are designed for but ask yourselves how many times we sacrifice our own values for the sake of profit for the sake of saving our skin for the sake of striking a deal the story of man is very gently encapsulated in this little story for the sake of profit if we are ready to sacrifice every value that we have we need to really reconsider everything we live in an age of guided missiles but misguided men we live in an age where we know the price of everything through the internet but the value of almost nothing we live in an age of fake news fake identities fake promises fake deals fake existence where we have somehow lost the touch of reality diplomacy is perhaps at such a high level that somewhere between the lines truth has lost its own meaning and i want to really emphasize that of course your excellency there are very much more emerging problems and immediate problems across the horizon but i perhaps feel that the disappearing of forest the disappearing of clean water the disappearing of clean air are very threatening perhaps climate change is a great problem in front of our eyes but i still believe that disappearing of human values is a greater challenge for that makes us human and keeps us human how many times we break off relationships have we ever wondered that we live in an age 
at no point in history have there been more peace conferences awareness for peace peace seminars peace books peace ideas and people like us roaming the world talking and preaching peace peace and peace at no point in human history there have been more discussions on peace and awareness on peace than today then why the largest earning industry in our world is still armaments where are the values that actually make us let me take you a step further at no point and no point in human history have there been more industries on entertainment and generating happiness think about it movies resorts entertainment industries tourism destination places video games customized entertainment at no point in human history have we invested and produced more points of entertainment than why somebody told me that the surest selling drug in the world is antidepressant somewhere down the line we have lost our path we are creating success after success but somehow losing the values that have made us successful and happy let me ask you a very frank question let me ask you a very frank question who doesn't know pornography is bad which country which culture which person does not know that pornography is bad then why does it still exist you know we have created a world of public successes but somehow private failures as the famous comedian charles chaplin as he was passing through europe he came to germany in cologne there was a competition look alike charlie chaplin knowing and being charlie chaplin he decided to enter in the competition you know now we have look like michael jackson look alike sachin tendulkar and so many people who dress or maybe have a hairstyle or maybe just walk like them they would enter and they would prize is who would be the most look alike this famous personality nobody had dreamt that charlie chaplin himself would participate in a look alike charlie chaplin competition and to his shock and horror he came number 7th he writes in his memoirs that i was shocked that in a look alike charlie chaplin competition i came number 7th because there were six other people who looked more likely me than me myself that's when he writes that we live in a world where showmen succeed and real men fail i want to ask you is money the only thing in our lives or can profits be equated in some other way in a different way if money was the only thing then excellence alone can help you attain that but ethics and values are the only things will help you sustain your own life and also broaden or create profits in a different way i brought some nine names and i don't want to be wrong that's why i wrote them in a piece of paper it was in 1923 and this example has almost become like a legend it was in 1923 the nine of the most successful businessmen and financiers of the world got together in chicago just like a conference like we have now and these nine people they said they control more money than majority of treasury of not just the united uh, states but most of the countries put together and the nine names i would just like to read out quickly to you one was charles schwab he was the president of the largest steel industry bethlehem steel samuel insel 
He was the president of the largest utility firm, General Electric. Howard Hobson. He was the president of the largest gas industry, Associated Gas. Then Arthur Cutton. He was a big wheat speculator. Then Richard Whitney. He was the president of New York Stock Exchange. Then Albert Fall. He was the member of President Hoover's cabinet, advisor to the president in the matters of finance. Then Jesse Livermore. He was the greatest bear on Wall Street who controlled the movements of shares. Then Leon Fraser. He was the president of the Bank of Settlements where companies did not agree. The Bank of Settlement, look at the figures. And Ivor Kruger. He was the head of the largest monopoly of the world. Nine people who controlled the economies and the wealth of nations had got together in 1923. And after 25 years, one was bankrupt, one was in a mental asylum, three had committed suicides, and three and four were in prisons. I want to ask you, what happened? Wealth alone and profits alone will not give you your life. We abhor the idea of the ancient times where people sold their wives and their children and their friends for the sake of profits. We snigger. We belittle them. But are you ready to sell your own lives for the sake of profits? Recently, in the scandal of Cambridge Analytica, where Facebook was put on trial for selling ideas and identities and information regarding people, and we ridicule and mock Facebook and we take it to trial, but I want to ask you, there is a saying that if anything is free on the internet, then the product is you. <laughs> When you take something free and give your information in your tastes and dislikes, you are the product that is being sold. For the sake of profits, we can't sell ourselves and our values. Because profits are there, and I don't want to say they're not there. But for the sake of profits, we can't reduce ourselves to such a level that values which have made us, our business, and strictly limiting yourself and myself to business, there was a time when businesses were done by trust, by handshakes, by words, by names. Whole shiploads were sold and agreements between countries were done just by trust. You know, one senior businessman like you, he kept telling his son that I want to put you in business. I want to teach you the tricks of trade. And the son kept telling dad that dad, please teach me the tricks of our trade early on because I need to succeed like you and take the business forward. His dad said, okay, at 12 o'clock at night, he asked his son, okay, come along, get on to this huge wall, which was about 10 or 15 feet high. The kid got up to that wall and he says, okay, Son, can you see me? He said, yes. Can you hear me? Of course, Dad. What is the distance between the top and the bottom? He said, 15 foot. He said, do you think I'm here and I can catch you? Of course, Dad. You've caught me so many times. Of course, I can catch you. Suddenly, the dad turns off the light. And the son says, the dad, I can't see you. He said, but can you hear me? I'm teaching you the trade of business. He said, I can hear you. Can you feel me that I'm right at the bottom of the wall? He said, yes. He said, then jump. He said, dad, but I can't see you. He said, but I can see you. So jump. Just jump. And the kid jumps. The dad doesn't catch him. He falls on his ground. He's hurt. He's trying and crying and says, dad, you didn't catch me. He said, rule number one in business, trust nobody. There was a time 
that our values were out of trust and now the time is eliminating the untrustworthy and then remaining the trustworthy. Look at your agreements. I'm not an expert on any agreement, trade agreements between countries, between businesses, between corporations. You know, in our agreements, the clauses of reliability are almost gone. The clauses of liability have become huge. The clauses of assurance have disappeared. The clauses of insurance have taken stance. The clauses of assimilation have completely gone. The clauses of dissolution, what if something goes wrong, have taken ground. And the clauses of cooperation are nowhere to be seen, but the clauses of arbitration are the most important. Our business has suddenly become more based on untrustworthiness than trustworthiness. Where have the values gone? And I want to ask you, so we need to breathe back and bring back those values. You could be the most famous and the most fortunate, but without values, you are worthless. Do I need to remind you of Tiger Woods, a child prodigy? It is said that almost 683 weeks, he remained the best golfer of the planet. Some of the best golfers have remained for one or two weeks. This is Tiger Woods. What happened? Extramarital affairs. Accidents. He was found sleeping in the car. He's gone into a special deprogramming program. He's being watched to bring himself back. Fame and fortune and profits are not enough. You need a set of values that make you human. What about Lance Armstrong? He was discovered with a cancer. He overcame cancer. Seven times consecutively winning Tour de France is the most exhausting sport you could ever think of. Consecutive seven times winning it, then they find out that he was on drugs. Everything was stripped of him. Not just the medals. His entire life was stripped of him. I don't want to give you any more examples. We live in an age of Nirav Modis and Malyas and also spiritual gurus who are in jail because of lack of values. Whether you are spiritual, whether you are businessman, whether you're your husband, whether you're a son, whether you're anybody, to remain human, values are your greatest profits. But let me also tell you about people who have nothing but values and look at them. I talked about people who have had everything but when they have stripped of values, they have nothing all their lives. But there are people who have lost everything. And yet if they have sustained their values, they have become the greatest idols of humanity. Let me take you to 1992, Barcelona Olympics. If you haven't heard about this, please go back and show your children what I'm talking about. There was a sprinter in 400 meters, Derek Redmond. He was a British 400 meter sprinter. He was tipped to win the gold medal. And Derek Redmond, in the final heats of the finals of Barcelona Olympics, he starts, when the gun goes off, he starts running for 150 meters. He's leading the pack. Again, tipped to be the gold winner. Suddenly, after 150 meters, there's a snap on his right thigh and his tendon or something in his ligaments breaks. He starts squirming and he falls and he's struggling on the field. All the runners are running at the front. There's a big gasp from the entire spectator, 65,000 spectators, suddenly they feel the leader of the pack has suddenly fallen, he's struggling, squirming in pain. The race is over. Still, even after the race, Derek Redmond gets up, limping with excruciating pain. He hops and hops and hops. Breaking security, one man comes through, 
it happens to be his father his father is asking derek not to finish the race there's no way of finishing the race but he still wants to finish the race hopping and hopping and hopping obviously in olympic laws if anybody helps you you are disqualified by default hopping along he finishes the race that he had come for and the fact was 65000 people stand up and give him a standing ovation for his spirit not winning the gold medal and even today every time the spirit of olympics is celebrated they only feature derek redmond and none of the gold medal winners you can lose your life and still win the world if you have a set of values values are more important than profits and here i really admire the congregation and i would identify with the president when he made a speech and said that you are concerned about lives the theme of this conference is safety and ethics let me bring a leaf out of history and tell you that when somebody focuses on human values profits generate naturally i hope all of you have heard of the famous industry alcoa aluminum corporation of america one of the largest aluminum industry with presence in 40 different countries it's not small 40 countries almost 200000 people employed that industry was going to the dogs there's no way loss after loss after loss after loss there was no way this industry could come up the board of directors decided that we need to bring breathe back life into our industry so let's bring in a new dynamic ceo who would take care of the industry and bring a huge change get ready for the surprise they roped in in 1987 they roped in paul o'neill go back and check the facts paul o'neill he came in as the ceo the first meeting of the board of directors everybody is hoping the investors are hoping everybody is hoping that this young dynamic ceo will turn the fortunes of the entire alcoa you know they were all expecting huge chiefs they were all expecting a great lecture they were expecting a presentation they were expecting facts and figures of how we can breathe back profits 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 the first lecture by the ceo paul o'neill to the board of directors was less than 10 minutes he came without papers he got up and he said my prime concern for alcoa is safety does it ring a bell mr president does it ring a bell he said my concern for alcoa is safety supreme safety i have found that because of injuries and lack of safety every 100 days two days are lost in the factory i want to bring it down from 2 to 0 that is my goal there is no other issues today to be discussed it's just safety suddenly one guy from the board he raised his hand and said uh, but uh, what about the profits he said my only profit is safety thank you very much the meeting is concluded straight away some of the board members they went back to their investors and they said god we've got a hippie in the room <laughs> he's crazy nothing can happen he did not just make this speech he righted it off with special laws and sub laws he said if in any company there's an injury and it takes life by default that manager is suspended if any of my little factory if there's an injury when a worker has to lose days because of that injury it's serious tell me i personally will go there and look after him all the days that the worker misses his wages should be doubled 
and that wage should be cut from the manager. Whosever fault it is, I don't want injuries in our factories and it creates a feeling of safety. He went on and on and on. He created a system and in the factory where there are no injuries, I will raise the wages equally for the entire factory floor. You know, to everybody's surprise, all the little people working on the floor, they got a feeling that there's a guy at the top and he cares about our lives. There's a guy at the top and he cares about my individual life. The commitment grew. Injuries decreased. And they say in the first year after he took over, the entire company made one billion dollar profit in just one year. And by the time he left office, the net worth of Alcoa was 27 billion, all because of the measures he took on safety. He proved to the world that there are profits in values. You may grow in numbers, but he proved to the world that there is a guy at the top who cares about the small men at the bottom. It is love and commitment that generates this environment. But sometimes you may have to take difficult decisions because I want to keep to this idea of safety and ethics. You may have to take decisions that actually burn your pockets. You know why most of the industrialists don't go for the safety measures? Because it's too much hassle and it's too much money. And most of the people in India, we feel that we have enough population so life is expendable. <laughs> it isn't. Do you have a heart? Then that heart should speak. So let me give you another example from your world. I don't want to quote examples from the scriptures. Let me give you an example from your own world that sometimes even when you see the figures running low, there is a profit even in those figures. In 1978, again, I'll go by the book and give you perfect ideas because that's very important. In 1976, a pharmaceutical company in America, Merck and Company, I think you heard, you've heard about it, a very famous pharmaceutical company. Their researcher, William Campbell, he was researching on parasites, creating a drug for parasites. In 78, when he was working on this, suddenly he found out that his little drug, which he was making for parasites, could work for river blindness. Now, river blindness, perhaps you've not even heard of the disease. It's not like cholesterol or hearts and things like that. It's something which is only common to the poorest of the poor part of the world, like West Africa, deserts of the Sahara. It's carried by a mosquito. Parasites are given into the bloodstream, and those parasites then deposit themselves into the eye. As time goes, people become blind. So when they found out that this researcher said that there is scope of finding a cure to river blindness, should we or should we not go ahead? All the facts and figures told this young new, again young new, CEO or vice president of the company, Merck, his name was Roy Vagalas. When it came to him, he started thinking, that this is an orphan drug. You know what an orphan drug is? That you have a drug which nobody can buy. Because the people that affect it are poor, they can't afford it. What's the use of creating a drug which doesn't sell? So it's known as an orphan drug. So what's the point, you know, to take one drug from research to actual production, it costs about $200 million. What's the use of spending $200 million on creating a drug for river blindness where well, all the poorest of the poor people can't afford that drug? Our duty is towards the investors, our duty is to the board of directors, our duty is to the people who, shareholders. Roy Vagalas was a person who believed in values. 
So he gave a go ahead. He said, go ahead with this drug because if there is a scope within my life to create a drug which will actually free more than 200 million people from a disease, we have to do it. It's a moral duty. The conflict between a profit and a moral or a valued duty came into four. Without asking the board, he took a decision. As time went, the drug emerged. But the biggest problem was distribution. The drug cost $3 to make and distribute. It wasn't possible. He went to WHO. He want, went to the voluntary organizations. They created a distribution system. They distributed $1.3 billion worth of drugs free to the people so they could cure themselves. By 1984, a drug which was making a loss, no money coming in. Japan, which was completely closed to any foreign pharmaceutical company, on the sheer basis of ethics, they allowed Merck to enter Japan in 1984, and after that, there's no looking back. They sold more than $4 billion worth of drugs in Japan alone of other makes of their own brand. Imagine, profits are not what you see. Profits are what you gain. Whether it's respect, whether it's name, and whether it's peace. If you have values, your profits will not just be in the bank accounts or the lockers, you yourself will become profitable. What's the use of having profits without peace? What's the use of growth without generosity? What's the use of development without dignity? And I want to leave you with a couple of incidents that those who have had nothing but have had values, they've raised the dignity of humanity and their country and life as a whole. Three things I would leave you with. Let's not talk about great values. Those are there and we believe in every value. For, for a businessman, there are three values I would want you to actually adopt and think about. If you cannot generate values, at least venerate values. If you cannot even venerate values, at least try and create values. I would leave you with three values which I believe every businessman here can share and deal with. First, Dr. Kalam often told me that he only asked one question as he moved around India and the world, and the question is, what can I give? When, he asked, when we asked him that, sir, how come you are so young and energetic for every event and every place, even with children, even with the great diplomats, he said, I only ask one question is, what can I give? I've learned it from Pramukh Swami Maharaj. He said, from your spiritual leader, whenever I see him, he's always trying to give his all completeness, everything to the people. So he said, I asked to our own countrymen, that what can you do today that can bring a smile to our whole nation? What can we give, not what we can take? When you do that, that what can we give, then default you will be making a contribution not to the life of others, but to your own life. That profit comes back to you completely. The second thing is if you can't give, at least forgive. So many people might have betrayed you. Somebody might have double dealt you. There may have been incidents where you felt cheated. Move along. Go beyond. You have greater things to do in life instead of storing all the hates and hurts in your life. If you can't forgive, you can't really move along in life. Look at Nelson Mandela. 28 years he was in jail. I have been to Robin Island and I've also had the great fortune of meeting Nelson Mandela in person. 28 years were robbed from him from his life. 
all because apartheid the white supremacists who actually ruined his life and conspired to actually kill him one of the leaders of that was john foster john foster was a person who conspired and put mandela in jail as circumstances would have it after mandela was in jail foster became the prime minister of south africa imagine you would lose belief in god saying he tricked me he actually buried me and look at him becoming the prime minister the moment john foster took over the prime ministership of south africa amongst the first thing he said that one of my dreams is to see mandela hanged the prime minister mandela is in a prison the prime minister says i want to hang him every now and then he tried to pass a bill in the cabinet of hang mandela hang mandela somehow it just got stalled it never really happened after 28 years john foster became a normal man the regime was out mandela was free on the shores of robin island when the entire world media got together the first question they asked nelson mandela mr mandela what do you think of john foster remember the man who conspired the man who made sure he's in jail the man who robbed him of his youth the man who cheated him the man who wanted to hang him they asked him the mr mandela what do you think of john foster mandela said he is a decent man and that's about it ask yourself can you or do you have a heart to forgive somebody nobody has sent you to jail nobody has hurt you in that way yet mandela said that if i did not forgive and if i carried all the bitterness in my heart even i after i was freed i would still be in a prison how many of us are public successes and private failures because we cannot forgive give whatever you can if you can't at least forgive and at least within this group please i want you to see and ask each other beg for forgiveness and forgive others you will have a great conference at the end of this day if you can't give at least forgive and lastly somebody would tell me ke swami this value of giving i can't give i don't even have a heart of forgiving but at least i want to tell you believe believe in your people believe in yourself believe in god believe in good things of life even if they are not above the horizon believe in them and when you believe and you have a strength of believe in a higher being or identity even in higher values you won't be able to be shaken from what you are you will have a strong life let me also quote you of somebody whose respect i have personally earned and i believe and see him with great respect he's not a sadhu you might have heard of the great tennis player arthur r ash he was the first black american to win the wimbledon in tennis i was a young boy and i still remember myself watching television and watching the finals in 1975 rooting for arthur ash and arthur ash won the wimbledon and he was a celebrated identity a celebrity all over the world a very gentle sportsman in 1983 he contracted aids and it was done through the fault of a hospital in blood transfusion everybody was horrified arthur ash could have gone legally gone after the hospital gone after the person or perpetrator that gave him a horrible disease but look at his way one fan wrote to arthur ash and said that mr ash you are the most celebrated sportsman of our country and of the world such a nice gentleman i wonder why god chose you for such a horrible disease you know many times we feel why me so many times we argue just me we feel victims we think 
everybody has deserted and we feel life is not fair. Arthur Ashe had all the elements and ingredients to ask, why me? You know what he wrote to the fan, which I also have in my diary? He wrote back that in this world, there are 50 million people who learn to hold the tennis racket. Of that 50 million, 5 million actually learn how to bounce the ball. Of that 5 million, half a million, 500,000 actually learn the rules of tennis. Of that 50,000 play tennis. Of that 5,000 play professional tennis. Of that 500 enter the circuit. Of that only 50 enter Wimbledon. And of that only one wins. When I was holding the trophy of Wimbledon, I never asked God, why me? Why should I ask God now, why me? In our times of success, we never ask. In our times of challenges, we stop believing. The real time to sustain your belief and beliefs are the times which are challenging. His Holiness Pramukh Swami Maharaj, and I believe everybody sees our London temple as perhaps the most successful temple in the world, is featured in the Guinness Book of World Records, in the Reader's Digest, is featured in so many places. Recently, Britain voted for one of the best and the most enterprising and eco-friendly religious building in the whole of England. The London Swaminarayan Mandir won that award. When the Olympic Committee in 2012 was searching for symbols and emblems to decorate the Olympic souvenirs, amongst the 10 buildings it selected from England, one was the non-British building of BAPS Swaminan Hindu Temple. When the temple was opened, the whole of Britain celebrated. But guess how France celebrated it? Because France and England are always at loggerheads. Le Monde featured the headline columns when the London Temple was opened in 1995. Le Monde featured a headline saying, The Empire Strikes Back. For 200 years, the British ruled and ruined India. What a beautiful way of taking revenge by creating a beautiful temple in the heart of London. Congratulations, India. So the London temple has been celebrated throughout by countries, by people, by it's the first traditional Hindu temple in the whole of the Western Hemisphere. But I want to tell you, perhaps if I want to single out the greatest failure of BAPS Swaminan Sansa, it would be the London temple. We actually tried 28 different sites and failed 28 times. Some sites were too difficult, some sites had too many problems, some sites were too expensive. We never wanted to build a temple in Nisdan. It's the most run-down area of England, full of crime. We were trying to move out of Nisdan, move out of Nisdan 28 times. Once we actually signed, you know, the, the, the government never allowed us planning permission. We got signatures of 80,000 local residents. Still, we lost the case. 28 times we failed. And that's when Pramukh Swami, our spiritual head, smiled. Somebody would have given up the project. He smiled and he said, maybe God wants us to build it where we don't want to build it. That's Nisdan. We built the temple where we never wanted to build it. And it has become the greatest success story of BAPS. Belief in God or higher beliefs. And I want to ask you, that yes, profits can be seen in figures. But if you have values, values will turn into profits. Even if they don't, values will make you a profit in the world. You will be valued beyond your own imagination. But I also want to tell you that sometimes it just requires a little, a little act, a little love, a little good deed and you can transform an entire nation, country and a field. I'll leave you with the last story which is again very close to my heart. It is in 1873 or 1874. The real story has become legendary. One little boy 
who was struggling to finish his education. Every now and then he would go from house to house, find a little job and errand, take more money and then pay for his fees. After struggling for seven days where he could not even get an errand or a small job from a house, he was so hungry without food or water, he decided to give up education. But he decided that one last house I will try. He knocked on the door. He knocked on the door and he decided that I'll ask for food and water or something to drink. Because he was hungry. When he knocked on the door, the door was opened by a very beautiful young girl. You know, beauty smittens a person. Instead of asking or begging for food, he decided there was a beautiful girl standing in front of him. He got himself together and the girl said, excuse me, do you want anything? He said, no, 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 no. He said, but you knocked on the door. He said, that was by mistake. He said, no, 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 you came right into our entire garden and you knocked on the door. Um, he said, no, look, he said, can I get you something to eat or drink? He said, no, 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 I'm not hungry. He was hungry. But this is how men are. <laughs> you know, he's saving his dignity. So I'm not hungry. She said, but wait a minute. She went inside. She brought a glass of milk. He ravenously drank that milk. And then he asked that how much does this cost? He had no penny. <laughs> but again, as men would be men. So he asked how much would it cost? The little girl said, the little girl said that my mother has taught me never get paid for kindness. So she closed the door. He once again by this little love and kindness regenerated values in his own heart and studied hard, 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 hard. He went on to become the very famous doctor, Dr. Howard Kelly, if you heard of his name. Once it so happened that this lady had grown older, she contracted a terminal disease which could not be treated in the villages. She was taken to Boston. Guess who was called to treat this little, this young woman? Dr. Howard Kelly was called to treat this lady years back. When he started treating her, he straight away realized that this could be the same woman or the girl who had given me milk at the right time. He treats her for weeks and weeks in a huge hospital. The woman becomes worried about money, money, money. She's scared. She's cured and very fearsome and worried. The lady asks that what are the fees for my treatment? Dr. Howard Kelly, he writes in the prescription, paid in full with a glass of milk. <laughs> paid in full with a glass of milk. And Dr. Howard Kelly went on to found the John Hopkins Medical Research Center and Hospital. Ask yourself, how much can your little glass of milk can do? How much your little love for your people can do? How much a little safety for your men and women can do? It can change lives, it can change countries, it can change humanity. But most importantly, it will change you. Profits are not always in figures. Profits are how you feel. I think everybody knows the value of profits. But I've come here just to express the profit of values. They are huge. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you again.